Everyone in the world knew where we were. To see this institutional gaslighting. How does the second official trailer portray Meghan and Harry? And what does this portrayal tell us about the message of the documentary? I'll approach this question from a linguistic and audiovisual point of view. This means that I'll be using concepts from linguistics and film theory. I hope and think that you'll find this video very useful. You can support this channel by liking the video and subscribing if you're new. Also, what do you think about this documentary? Let us all know in the comments. Let's get to the spicy stuff, starting with ancient Greek. A trailer is a so-called paratext. In Greek, para can mean around, and that's exactly how we should think about paratext. They're circling around the main text without being the main text. The main text can be texts such as movies, documentaries, or books, the final result, so to speak. Paratexts are associated with, but distinct from the main text. Paratexts say something about the main text, and thus guides the viewer's perception of it. Other paratexts include official websites, merchandise, press releases, behind the scenes, and title sequences. Even events are paratexts, since they're part of the advertising for the main text. In short, a paratext can be understood as advertising. Trailers set expectations, and they have to be consistent with the genre of the main text. Otherwise, audiences will be displeased with the main text once they watch it. For example, there can't be any disparity between music and genre. Let's analyze the second official trailer for this meaningful documentary and consider the concepts mise-en-scene, sound and cinematography. These three work together in guiding the viewer's attention and shaping his or her experience right from the beginning. I wonder what would have happened to us had we not got out when we did. The music is in minor key and has a thoughtful feel to it. This is consistent with Harry reflecting on what would have happened to them. He's seen in a medium shot. Medium shots can allow us to see a person's hand gestures. Harry's hands are close together, signifying said thoughtfulness, but also overview, as if he has the overview and the energy to reflect on the past. In terms of mise-en-scene, the background's very blurred. Blurred backgrounds are used in order to bring attention to the person speaking. It's the filmmaker's way of convincing us that what Harry is saying now is very important. We can contrast it to this medium long shot that allows us to see more of the homey surroundings. While still blurred, there's more space for the viewer to metaphorically step into the frame. Linguistically, Harry us. uses I collective pronouns. He says us and we, making it sound like a shared decision, showing that he and Megan are a team, supposedly. However, he doesn't say leave, he says got out, which makes it sound more dramatic, like an escape. This dramatization favors the narrative they maintained, that circumstances forced them to make this decision, and thus, that they haven't done anything wrong. These trailers and the Oprah interview are devoid of personal accountability. It's a consistent victim narrative. Our security was being pulled. Everyone in the world knew where we were. In theory, close-ups not only bring us close to the protagonists, at least who the filmmakers want us to perceive as protagonists, but they also bring us closer to their feelings and minds. The ultimate end goal with this is to make us empathize with them. And the melancholic music makes this process easier, in theory. I keep saying in theory because it's the audience that has the final say. The scholar Robert Rowland coined the term narrative believability. It can be realized as a scale that has to do with whether or not we find the source reliable. The source, in this case, being Megan. What do we know about the source, and does our knowledge about them match what we hear them saying? Filmmakers can use as many audiovisual tricks as they want in order to establish identification, but if the credibility of the source is low, it won't have much or any impact. On the contrary, the viewers might get annoyed with the stylistic choices. 
Meghan turns to the lack of protection excuse that she overstated in her interview with Oprah. However, since she's made many different complaints, it's hard to know which one viewers are supposed to take seriously. As I've pointed out in previous videos, Meghan's wanted people to pity her by complaining about anything and everything. From the lack of protection to having to google songs and hymns, that nothing was offered to her, that Catherine really hurt her feelings, which she makes sure to emphasize, even though, of course, she's not trying to be disparaging. In the podcast, she's looked for pity by saying that ambition was the problem, that people couldn't handle her ambition. And in her interview with the cut, she complained about the royal protocol for releasing photos and for having to give up her passport. That's a lot of different complaints, but they all have one thing in common. They're devoid of personal responsibility. Everything is always someone else's fault, and she shows no understanding or willingness to understand why certain institutions work the way they do. Individuals, institutions, and entire societal structures are criticized, and no claim seems to be too baseless. How have we culturally allowed that to be the case? There's nothing wrong with talking about a woman's success or her ambition or her financial prowess. Why is it culturally we are equipping girls and women to think that if you are ambitious, there's something negative about that? This is called visual proof. Documentaries seek to give the impression that they're objective and well-documented. Visual proof to match the words is part of this. However, we shouldn't let the authoritative term proof fool us. Many times, frames and entire scenes are merely reconstructions or taken from different contexts. I said that we need to get out of here. This is interesting because in the Oprah interview, he indicated that he wasn't prepared for Meghan coming to him and expressing concern for her mental health. He said that he went to a dark place as well. The words as well presuppose that he wasn't in a dark place before Meghan said this to him. We are on a freedom flight. Vlogs live up to Irving Goffman's criteria for self-presentation or impression management. They are characterized by personal confessions, making the intimate sphere public. Generally, people like to see other people confess, either because they struggle with the same problems, or the opposite, that they don't struggle with these problems, but just enjoy thinking, I'm glad it's not me. However, the vlogger edits and thus controls, so are we really exposed to reality? That's an important question. Here, the vlog style is designed to bring us close to Harry, just like the framing. However, we should keep the concept narrative believability in mind. Do we actually empathize with Harry when he calls it a freedom flight? Or do we think that he sounds entitled and spoiled? Because implicitly, he seems to be calling the very privileged life he's had in the UK on free. To see this institutional gaslighting. It's interesting to hear them use this word, referring to when someone distorts reality and makes other people doubt their judgment and intuition. Given the many different things Harry and Meghan have blamed over the years, many viewers would think that Harry and Meghan are guilty of doing exactly that, that the use of this word is projection. Harry saying this word could be a way of anticipating objections, monopolizing the word before the opposing side does. In terms of mise-en-scene, Harry and Meghan are seen sitting side by side, literally as well as metaphorically. This placement corresponds to the collective pronouns they use, making it look and sound like they're in total agreement. These camera sounds are non-diegetic and have been enhanced to sound frightening, like shots. This was also the case in the first trailer, which I've also analyzed. But there's also planting of stories. This feeding frenzy. They're never going to protect you. This sound introduces contrast between it and the thoughtful music and the homey environment. Symbolically, then, the sound introduces an antagonist in contrast to the protagonist victims. But I wasn't being thrown to the wolves, I was being fed to the wolves. Logically, it's the same thing. If you're being thrown to them, you'll automatically get fed to them. Unless you're a superhero, of course. Maybe the next documentary will be about superpowers. Who knows at this point? They were actively recruiting people to disseminate disinformation. Similar to the first trailer, the opposing sides portrayed as a nameless, faceless group that isn't allowed to speak in the trailer. They're simply referred to as they, and visually portrayed as inanimate objects, such as newspapers. 
We only hear Harry and Meghan and their supporters. In theory, this further emphasizes the protagonist-antagonist framework, highlighted by the mise-en-scene, sound and cinematography. Rhetorically, however, it's a cheap trick. It's very easy to make generalizations about a nameless, faceless group without having to deal with each specific criticism. It's also worth noting that the interviews with Harry and Meghan and the carefully chosen experts or helpers are done with an interviewer. The interviewer is outside the frame and we don't hear him or her. Stylistically, this choice gives absolute truth value to Harry and Meghan's statements. In theory, of course, and it shows us who the filmmakers want us to root for. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. Harry continues with the pronoun they, which the expert or helper also used. A small detail like this makes the narrative in a trailer coherent, as if the main protagonists and their helpers are in total agreement. This is the point where things get personal. This can't be understood as anything but an attack on William and Catherine as well, as Harry claims that they lie to protect him, but not them. This way of arguing is one that we should avoid, because it not only sounds generalizing and vague, it also sounds like jealousy, that Harry wants what his brother has. It's inconceivable that William would ever argue this way. On the contrary, it's been important to him to highlight the bond he has with his brother, or had. Because we'd all agreed we're just going to do like a, you know, a show okay. run, kind yeah, of like just joke. make it look good, but don't go whatever. And then I turn around, I see the glint in my brother's eye and I see the, the <laughs> cheeky grin that my yeah. wife's got. And I'm like, all right, it's on. And Harry's already about 30 yards down the track. <laughs> so there was, I was like, yeah. I mean, it sounds to me that you're calling for a rematch on that there one. Is, there is a, <laughs> yeah. need of a rematch, definitely. Yeah. yeah. This would have been a good time for Harry to ask himself the obvious question. Why is it that we face so much opposition, but my brother and his wife face little opposition. This would have been a good time for introspection, but he chooses not to reflect on his own behavior, the same way Megan chooses not to. Instead, it's other people and entire societal structures that cause the problems, always. This is a very navel-gazing way to look at the world, to put it mildly. But if we look at social media, victim narratives, as deceptive as they are, can be quite profitable today. This slightly screeching sound paraphrases brother. what Harry's saying, my because Harry's talking about a contrast, a divide between the two, and the sound has that same separating function. And again, the protagonist-antagonist framework is evident. Notice how we don't see a happy or homey image of William and Catherine. We only see that of Harry and Meghan looking at a pond. Doesn't seem staged to me. They just wanted to be free. They wanted to be free to love and be happy. We see more homey images and block style into meditation strategies as the freedom discourse is repeated. Once again, creating coherence in the trailer, not to be confused with coherence in reality. It's a risky discourse to keep repeating because it's not like the two were literal prisoners. On the contrary, they both come from privileged backgrounds. But where are you from originally? I'm born and raised here in LA. Los Angeles! Yes, I'm one of the five. You can pinch me, I'm real. See that? Oh, yes. Well, you, are your parents in show business? My dad is a DP, yes. I, uh, he was the lighting director. <laughs> my dad. Director of photography. My dad. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it sound so... No, so it's all right. It's, I'm just... No, it's fine. Yeah. So, uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for 10 years. I was there. Wow! I know. I'm there in my school uniform, right? Oh, yeah. And then the guests... <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke, kind of. A joke, kind of. There's nothing wrong with the privileged background. In fact, I don't like the word privileged, because it's so often used to silence intelligent and motivated people. But when considering the concept narrative believability, this freedom discourse might not be the first thing on the viewer's mind when looking at Harry and Meghan. Also, to the adverb just is used for simplification, to make it sound like what they wanted was something very simple that everyone can relate to. However, is what they want really so simple and relatable? Not when we look at the many complaints about extremely small things in Megan's interviews, not to mention her podcast. There always seems to be something wrong. I applauded that. 
And this is exactly what Harry and Meghan want us to do. Applaud what they're doing. A statement like this is a way of guiding the viewer's mind. Notice how he says it them. in a short musical break. I applauded that. The reason behind I a break like this is to bring full attention to the statement. As viewers, a break like this almost absorbs us before it releases us. I applauded that. Next, consistent with the verb applauded, we get the applause in form of the music finally erupting with joy. All the joy that Harry and Meghan have had to hold back, while taking jabs at the royal family, of course. In order for us to be able to move to the next chapter, you've got to finish the first chapter. Chapter, not challenge. Also giving up, giving, giving up <laughs> your nice career. Yes, nice. yes. Nice. But I, I don't see it as giving anything up. I just see it as a it's change. A, it's, a new, it's a new challenge. It's a new, it's a new chapter. Yeah. It gave us a chance to create that home that we had always wanted. I hope that the point about Paratex being advertising is painfully obvious by now. Because this has turned into one big photo shoot. Notice how Megan's almost whispering towards the end of the sentence. It gave us a chance to create that home that we had always wanted. This is called affective or emotional prosody, a pathos element used for appealing to the viewer's heart. It's used in speeches and movies as well. I've always felt as though this was a fight worth fighting for. The trailer ends with Harry verbalizing the prevalent freedom discourse, portraying him as a fighter who never had any doubt, who took on the antagonist known as they, and won the freedom that most people would say that he had never lost. Notice the enhanced bright colors, the sun, the sky. This is in contrast to the frame that William was in. First of all, it's a formal gathering, signifying something impersonal. Secondly, they're surrounded by other people, as if they aren't free, or at the very least, that they aren't by themselves. And thirdly, notice the grey building in the background. We don't see the sky because we don't see the building end. This is a stylistic device known from movies as well. In the brilliant movie Seven, the depressing and, by the way, nameless city is illustrated by this frame. We don't see the building end. So it's almost like we can't breathe or see a way out of it. It's the same with this frame, emphasizing Harry's point in the Oprah interview about feeling trapped in the royal family. There are lots of other things to focus on, but this will have to do for now. Click the like button and subscribe if you're new. See you next time.